<laughs> All right. <laughs> so again, I really want to, I really appreciate Margaret your coming and playing. It was really wonderful. We really enjoyed it. Welcome all of you so much. I'm so glad you're here to welcome to Malvern Books. Uh, we're so happy to have Dave Oliphant here with us tonight. Joe Bratcher, the owner of Malvern Books, and Dave go back a long way. Probably 20 years or so, at least. So at least. They worked on a number of projects together. So it's like old home week here, you know, to have, have Dave here with us. And we're thrilled that Dave chose to have his book release party for his new poetry collection here with us. Unfortunately, Joe couldn't be with us tonight, but he sends his best, and he's really happy that you're here. Dave has 13 collections of poetry, and he's won numerous awards, including an Austin Book Award, Best Book of Poetry at the New York Book Festival, and the Texas Institute of Letters Translation Award. His latest collection, The Cowtown Circle, was published in 2014 by the Alamo Bay Press. He was with the University of Texas at Austin for 30 years, as an editor and senior lecturer, and currently he and his wife Maria live in Cedar Park. Please join me in welcoming Dave Olivier. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's uh, great to see uh, old friends and uh, uh, people that I've known for many years, and I'll, I'll mention a few of you as I go along, I know. Uh, I'll tell you in advance that uh, uh, I'm basically not a lyric poet, which means that I don't write short poems. I have a tendency to, to write epics, and uh, everything I write just about is too long to be read. But I am going to uh, read some parts of some longer poems. Uh, and uh, most of the poems I'll read are more than one page long, so I hope you can bear with me. I'm going to try to break up the reading a little bit by playing a few uh, jazz pieces myself, but I'm only using the CD player. I can't, uh, can't play an instrument the way uh, Margaret can. Uh, and. Uh, I'm going to read um, first uh, two poems from uh, an earlier book, in fact, a much earlier book for, from 40 years ago. Um, and then I'll read from the, uh, the new book. I want to begin uh, by reading um, a couple of paragraphs from my memoir, uh, my autobiography, uh, which only comes up to page uh, to uh, the year of 1976. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, I've lived longer than I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the exams and essays written to satisfy school requirements, my first work of unassigned writing was a love poem in the sonnet form. With the creation of that sonnet, I could not have known that I had just entered into a lifetime of literary endeavor. Dating from the 1959 spring semester of my sophomore year, at Beaumont's then Lamar Tech, now Lamar University, my sonnet was dedicated to Carey, a trumpet player who was then studying, as I was, with Professor Richard Burkhardt. One day after Carey had left her practice room in the music department's old dilapidated army barracks, I sneakily placed my handwritten, unsigned piece in her horn case. Once Carrie discovered and read the sonnet, she told me when I happened to be hanging around that the clarinet player on whom she had a crush must have written her a poem. <laughs> I did not say anything at the time, but eventually she learned that I was the poet. 
Since I did not retain a copy of that inaugural poem, I can say nothing about its contents other than the one detail that remains in my memory. Carrie's use of pumpkin colored lipstick. In the fall of 1958, I had taken the first half of British literature from Dr. Robert Nossum, chairman of Lamar Tech's English department. In the course, we had read the Petrarchan sonnets of Wyatt and Surrey. And in writing of Carey, I found the sonnets traditional form congenial to my need to express a romantic infatuation. Although my first attempt at poetry did not attain its intended aim, which was to impress Carey with my affection and intellection, I so enjoyed writing the sonnets that I would compose poem, poems from that time on, unperturbed by that first and every subsequent rejection. <laughs> Some 15 years later, I would return to the Carey episode in music history, a piece included in my 1976 collection, Lines and Mounds. So the reason that I, I wanted to read that primarily was to introduce uh, the poem I'm going to read from Lines and Mounds. This was, uh, I've had 13 books and I had had several before this one, but I always considered this my first real book. And this was published by Thorpe Springs Press. Uh, Foster Foreman sitting over here and her husband Paul published this book and it still means maybe as much uh, to me as any book I've ever had published. And you can see on the uh, cover, and, and Foster found this uh, drawing, uh, this is a snake. You can see the snake here, and here's an egg that it's going to uh, swallow. This is one of the uh, Hopewell Indian mounds in the Midwest, and that's what the mounds refer to. The lines refer to the Nazca lines in Peru. And uh, so I want to read uh, from here. Uh, th this was a series of poems that I did uh, based on those two uh, Indian uh, pictographs, uh, you might call them. This is from uh, Victor von Hagen's Realm of the Incas. The greatest mystery of the Inca Nazca culture is the vast network of lines, a fantastic assembly of rectangles and squares that have been etched into the sand and waste gravel. Outsized birds, spiders, whales, and surrealistic figures are also present. And then this is about the mounds. Generations have seen and puzzled over the continents man-made earthen lumps. The first settlers east of the Mississippi Valley came upon thousands, many flanked by geometric earthworks of astonishing precision. Some form shapes of humans or animals. <clears throat> well, I want to begin by reading a poem based on, uh, on those Nazca lines and uh, <clears throat> That description uh, alludes to one of the uh, uh, creatures that uh, is depicted in those lines, and uh, that's what this poem is about. This is entitled Leviathan, an elegy for Pablo Neruda. Oh, makers, you surely had him in mind. Yet even you with such majestic maps, that mysterious way of shaping the fan of a tail would chart the stars, could not have guessed so extensive a range as this singer's residence and ode. But choose you did the measure meet, Met metaphor of the man would sound your land, though still you miss the mark as all have fallen short. For to do him justice would call for jaws seemingly at rest upon the ocean floor, while above where the albatross shadows 
His cross upon the curving waters. A geyser would need to shower the waves and desert grooves. How could they grow a fruit brought forth from the sea? As out of His depths the likenesses towered, an ambergris melon submerged in summer's grass. The making of such similes taking at the very least a hemisphere of comforts and howls. For even to his hurricane reaches the Mediterranean would only equal but a drop in a galactic lake. Any comparison turning finally absurd as Wyatt and Surrey's hyperboles, where sick with elephantiasis were their lovers' renaissance sighs. And thus so huge is the praise he's due, unwieldy the hulk I've tried to sail for a sighting of Chile's poet whale, that at last I enter this nutria slough, and stepping on bank of cow-cow bayou, find the cattle tracks more my size, hoof prints and hay cakes easier on eyes than readings underneath beyond the skies. A safe return to the Texas coast, the shoals and shallows of home. But like Plato's enlightened soul, blind from that black fire swallowed schools, Come back to sense in the horse manure, an image of meteor and moon, a fresh green pile changed utterly, though the terrible American beauty is gone. Yet still he leads us on through a tunneled celery sea, up to the apogee of its green lineal lightning, on from there to Machu Picchu, aerial mate, to the Nazca lines, only his own more heightening. Did you get, uh, did you get those uh, specific references, Miguel? Much to the old, of course, huh? the old to Machu Picchu. Uh, well, you got the heights of Machu Picchu, yeah. But what about the other, the, uh, the watermelon? Did you get that? No. It's the Ola a la Sandia. Well, he has a lot of Ola. Yes. And then the apogee is the apogeo uh, del uh, apio. El apio. And that was celery. Yeah. That's where I got, that's where I got the, because uh, uh, he has relampagos uh, uh, linealis. Linealis. Yeah. Incredible. Okay, so I, I'm talking to my friend Miguel here because he's uh, he knows uh, Latin American literature better than I do, uh, and and I want to read this one uh, because uh, this is one of his favorite poets. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not mistaken. This is a poem entitled, Mural on Old Jail Wall, Mora, New Mexico. Now, I'll just tell the story of this. My wife and I went to New Mexico, and we went up toward Lubbock and then, or Amarillo, off, and so we could go. I don't know why she wanted to go to Mora, but we went to this little town. Have you ever been to Mora? I think yeah. so. And uh, when Just we were there, through. we discovered there was an old jail, uh, and they, uh, I don't remember why we knew about that, but when we got to, to Santa Fe, uh, I discovered in a museum there that they had a wall that they had taken out of that jail, and they took it to Santa Fe and put it in a museum. <laughs> and uh, so I wrote this poem about that wall, uh, in Fort Worth, this was in 1976, uh, 75, what, God, 40 years ago, uh, when uh, we were in Fort Worth, I was waiting for papers for us to be able to go to Mexico and uh, to move there. Uh, and uh, I was reading Octavio Paz's Sunstone, a long poem, and he would sometimes use eight-line stanzas in that poem. Not always, not consistent, 
But I liked the, the way they looked, the shape and everything, the way he did. So I, I wrote this in eight line stanzas after Octavio Paz. Mural on old jail wall, Mora, New Mexico. A lion drawn in charcoal, an animal the inmate never saw. Its square menacing jaw, its massive shaggy mane, rousing his sail to circus life. By the stare of beady eyes and black nose shaped like Aladdin's lamp shedding what light on thoughts of apocalypse, vengeance, or escape. Proving himself no mighty posa, no square, was herded in and slammed behind bars, sentenced to facing four bare walls, or traded open air for three squares a day. Found filling, though not so vital as when after punching cows or riding fence, the ranch house triangle was heard to clang out time for chowing down. So four long fangs now form a cube, two above, two below, feeding his hungry head. Four smaller incisors add a box within that box. Everywhere black squares, the thick tongue one, the paw another with its four nailed claws. A pollux higher breaks the pattern. Yet even the mane, parted and hanging, is a three-sided square of hair. Incarceration reflected through art's release. No full-grown beast on all fours, but a square become a fearsome jaw. Its figure a clear-cut threat or an order out of chaos. To what purpose? What nightmare? Right angle to what desire? Gnashing and decision and inner fire. By day, the cat half in sun, half in shade, beams lower, the bars cast shadow stripes, turn him more ferocious, tiger-like till later moonlight lends a friendly grin when the artist in his visionary bunk squints and admires the midnight effect of a softer glow on the adobe brick, his sketch tamed, his mind the same. Four walls, but none holds him in, his mattress on one a cushion, a flower bed with springs of revenge. On a second, his window, provider of sky. The door, a source of wheat and rain. The fourth, with this canvas of colors that change. An easel to ease hard knocks, blast hates, let hot air out. Inflate with dread imaginings his tawny carbon skin. Would he be ushered into the maw of strength? passed courageously through the portal jaws, the ivory pillars open wide with a flash on the apocalyptic stars of intestinal night, close shut as bars on a grate or cell, his memories conducting to heaven or hell. Which will it be? Artistry unable to tell. True torment, the waiting it out in the dark. Yet looking into the pit, he may well see himself the main feature in uniform on safari, confronting the trials of African grass, torrential floods or locust swarms, safe in his cave, subduing tribe after tribe, in shorts as in newsreels from the 40s. Here as if the roar of Metro Goldwyn Mayer starring handsome him, hero, one and only. Come at last to know his lair's patient lingo, his redemptive talk captive back of the teeth, of this king caged within his cell block wall, touches thus to his own a tongue rippled and arched, 
ready as a damned river of melted mountain snow to burst over his rocky dental 